and gentlemen, the great Eric Macromella. That is your new intro song, Eric, by the way. <laughs> just so you know, we just put that together. <laughs> if you go to Offside, a sports law blog, you will find Eric Carmen and Louise Mandrell on Eric's blog. And, and what, did you, what did you call it? Mag, uh, magical, the sensory overload magic. Something like yeah, sensory overload. <laughs> sensory overload. Hey, it's great you guys are going to the blog. Hey, when, when I saw that, I'm a big pop culture guy, but that was too much to handle. <laughs> and uh, there was too much going on. I felt overwhelmed, <laughs> but drawn to it. So I did what any reasonable Egyptian lawyer would do. Put it on my blog. Honestly, Eric, I've watched it since I since I saw it on the blog. I've watched it like every day, and I keep watching. It. It's hilarious. I'm I'm trying. I'm at the point now. I like the Miami Vice thing. I, I agree with you with Eric Carmen and and Louise Mandrell's prom dress. Awesome. I'm I'm debating now who had better hair. <laughs> I don't know, because they're both equally beautiful in their own way, and their psychiatrists would, would, would just tell them that, I'm sure. Now, you guys, remember, when you guys post this clip online, you have to give me the intro of the clip so I can pass this around, because this song, I walk down the law firm hallway, and it's playing in offices. <laughs> That's your intro. It's your walking around music. From now on. From that now is on. that is Eric Macromella right the, there. The great Eric Macromella from Offside, a sports law blog, and host of Offside, the business and law of sports on the Team 1200 radio in Ottawa. You can also listen to him on Team1200.com, and you should. It's uh, it's great radio, and pop culture references abound. Um, <laughs> listening listening on the, uh, on the on the radio clip, you were on the Team 1200, and I want to start off with this because fighting in hockey and, and the Derek Bugard, in the article that came out in the New York Times, is a three-piece article, and then Gary Bettman came out after the, the uh, Board of Governors meetings and cited that there's a lack of data and played down the findings that Derek Bugard and fighting led to his chronic CTE. And he said, basically, there's insufficient data to warrant the NHL taking a harsher stance on fighting. Is he putting himself... Eric in a bad legal position right here by saying stuff like that. You know, those words were actually carefully chosen from a lawyer's perspective. As you know, he's a lawyer, but yes. the in-house lawyers uh, either write that or strongly recommend the language. And he chose those words very carefully, as did Bill Daly, who's, who also chose similar type of language, referring to it as new science, for example. What they're basically saying is they're trying to anticipate a claim for negligence. And when you sue someone for negligence, when you sue them for money, what you're doing is you're saying, look, you had a duty to care for me, and, and you didn't discharge that duty. And part of the argument would be, well, look, you know, you knew that, that headshots and, 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 uh, and punches to the head, excuse me, caused degenerative brain disease, and you didn't do anything, and you let us continue to fight. And perhaps you might have concealed some information, for example. So what Batman and Daly are saying is, look, we aren't there yet from a scientific standpoint. Uh, science hasn't yet caught up, perhaps, to common sense. There is no empirical data that links, that creates a causal link between fighting in hockey and degenerative brain disease. And if you don't have causation, if you don't have proof of a link, then you, you don't have a strong claim for negligence. And so that's why that language was chosen. It was chosen very carefully. But I've said this before, that once science catches up to common sense, that's when I think the NHL will outlaw fighting. I don't see fighting in the NHL in, in, in 15 years and probably gone within 10 years because I've said this before. Liability drives policy. Yeah. The potential to be sued results in new rules. Look at the NFL with our friend Harrison today finally suspended for a game. For a game. It's a sixth incident in, in two games. And uh, uh, don't be started. a game is, is far too lenient. It, it is right. absolutely ridiculous. He is defiant. His reaction is LOL on Twitter to the suspension. It is absolutely absurd. But that aside, the NFL takes these steps for a reason. The, NX, the NHL has taken steps. They, they put together a committee in 2007. They have that quiet room. Uh, right. you know, it's, it's utility aside. They have that. Those are done by the lawyers. It's not done to make the game more enjoyable. They've outlawed primary contact of the head it's not for us it's for the courts that's why they're doing it but that's but that's why if, if i'm a lawyer for say the, a plaintiff who is suing the nhl or family of a plaintiff suing the nhl because of, of fighting like Derek bugard's family i would say then well wait a second if you don't believe that there's a link 
why did the league go so hard on changing its rules on headshots and add further stiffer discipline, discipline and supplementary discipline to those penalties when you obviously thought that there was some sort of connection there, yet you're not going to make that connection to fighting? I mean, it seems to me that you you understood what was going wrong. You understood that there was potential for harm, but yet you kept fighting in the game. Why? Yeah, I think, you know, from a... Uh... You know, I, I can see that appearing to be contradictory, but, you know, I, I think you might be able to arguably, Drew, arguably distinguish them. They get rid of primary contact to the head. So Pacioretty on Latang is a great example. Right. That would never have been in a suspension last year or the year before. So they're saying with that primary contact to the head, we're just trying to rule out concussions because we're losing our players. But the whole idea of fighting and that it's shots to the head, uh, they may take the position that that's a whole different issue. The other thing is, you look at Bugard, the number that jumps out at me is 174. And those are the number of fights he has been involved in at the NHL level, wow. uh, in, in, in minor league hockey, in junior. So there's this cumulative body of work. So the, pro- the issue, if Bugard's family wanted to sue, I talked before about causation. I could show that A causes B. Punches to the head and fights re- resulted in him taking his life. Well, the, the uh, issue there is causation. Right. Where did the damage occur? And can you say strictly as a result of him playing in the NHL? Or is it the aggregate effect of all of those punches over time? So here's the thing, Drew. It's one thing to sue somebody for negligence, but it's another thing to prove it. You've got to show A causes B. And in a case like this, while you and I, from a common sense perspective, go, come on, man, yeah. get rid of fighting. It's idiotic. Right. You have to prove it, and that's entirely different. Um, when you look at it, it goes back to what you said before, and I can't remember, but it was the, uh, was, it, was it Emerson who, who said that the law has nothing to do with? Oh, that was Oliver Wendell Holmes. Oliver Wendell Holmes. Former U.S. Supreme Court Justice. Right, yes. right. Um, so it goes back to that. It, 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 so does the CBA protect an employer from being sued by an employee? Oh, that's, you know, that's a great question. And just to back up what Holmes said was, this is a court of law, not a court of, just, uh, right. not a court of justice. So it nothing to do with justice, it's the law. Does the CBA protect? That's a terrific question. The answer is actually in part, because the CBA provides for disability benefits. It provides for those types of benefits after a player retires or gets hurt. The only time where the league may not be insulated from liability is if a player can show that the NHL knew of the devastating effects of headshots, for example, right. but concealed that information. And that's precisely what we have seen in the two NFL concussion lawsuits. The players have alleged, including Jim McMahon, former QB for the, yep. uh, for the Bears, he has said in, in the statement of claim, in, in, sorry, in the complaint where they outlined their claim, that the NFL knew about this, but they didn't tell us. So we continue to play the game of football, and now I walk into a room, and I forget where I am. Can, can I argue then, though, on that case, or in those situations, that this is, this is one, one argument always bothers me when I hear people say, if this happened on the streets, so-and-so would be arrested. Yeah, but on the streets, I'm not expecting that, nor have I, I tacitly agreed to it because I've... I've partaken in this in walking down the street. If I'm partaking in sports, I am agreeing to, or at least I'm understanding that there are inherent risks involved in the game that may occur to my body. Can I argue that from the league standpoint is that we, that you already willingly agreed to put your body on the line and you got paid handsomely to do it. You're, you're, I think you're smack on and uh, you and I should open up a law practice together. <laughs> every time we talk, you are talking like a lawyer. Uh, just don't send me a bill. Okay, I won't. <laughs> the, <laughs> I'm waiting for yours. <laughs> the uh, principle, uh, the legal principle there is called voluntary assumption of risk. And what that basically means is when your skate touches the ice, it's like you're signing a contract. You're saying, I consent to incidental contact in the game, and I also consent to fights, because fights are understood to be part of the game. So when Bugard goes on the ice or players go on the ice, they understand that they're subject to a certain level of violence that is otherwise not acceptable in other parts of society, for example, a parking lot. Right. So that issue of consent, you're absolutely right, Drew, is massive. So causation plus consent 
equals very tough lawsuit. Wow. Um, let's let's talk about Ryan Braun for a minute. And and again, here's here's a guy who's um, maybe not in any legal trouble because we're looking at elevated levels of testosterone and instead of performance enhancing drugs. If it was performance enhancing drugs, maybe you'd have you'd have some sort of argument where there could be legalities involved. But from a a standpoint of his defense team looking at this, if you were on this defense team, how do you attack a drug test like this? It is most difficult. Yes. I mean, you can appeal the finding. A player is entitled to grieve under the CBA. They can re-examine the sample. But we have seen this time and time again, the grieving process, the declarations that I am innocent seem to result in absolutely nothing changing. Mm-hmm. But his, his, his recourse is grieving under the CBA. But, guys, I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not seeing that that's going to be successful unless there was some kind of debacle in the way that the samples were taken. I mean, let's think back to other players. Exactly. Manny Ramirez, you know, twice. You know, I mean, that ended up with Manny Ramirez being asked by Major League Baseball to retire. Yep, see you later. And he did. Now he wants back. But <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I think the myth of the false positive, too, the, the, rare, the rare instance that there is a false positive, I think that blows him out of the water. If you're advising Ryan Braun, would you advise him to, to say, hey, listen, tell me now, and if you did it, let's step up and let's admit it, or do you just keep going through this, this process? I think, you know, that is a great question. I mean, you have to sit him down, look him in the eyes, and say, look, everything you say to me is privileged and confidential. I cannot share it with anybody. And I say this all the time to my clients. Right. I, can't, I can give you the best advice if you're completely honest with me. So don't lie to me. Clients still lie. But don't <laughs> lie to me. Once you give me the truth, I can figure out what is best for you. And if he has taken it, then you have to, no pun intended, you have to come clean. You have to apologize. You have to serve your time. Now, if, if he didn't do it, then he grieves and he continues to proclaim his innocence. But you have, to, you have to be able to know precisely really what is the truth because you can only massage this, I think, if you know what he really did. Eric, it's always great talking to you. I love talking to you, my friend. I'm glad that you came on. Eric Macromella, Offside, a sports law blog and host of Offside, the business and law of sports. But you got to go to Offside, a sports law blog. Before you go... Uh, you're you're walking around music. There is the great Eric Macromella. They don't come any better than that. That is loud, eh? That is very. But loud. I don't even care. It sounds so good. Uh, don't you just love talking to Eric Macromella? There it is. Um, go to Offside, a sports law blog. With Eric Macromella. It is outstanding stuff. I mean, you know me. I'm not a smart guy. No, he makes you look smart, he though, with all the compliments he gives well, you. Because and... I, yeah. I read his blog all the time. He's a great dude. It's I, great, I'm a huge great fan. Great guy, fantastic. And, uh, guy. of course, that song, in case you're saying, where the heck do I know that song from? That's a theme song from Growing Pains. Coaching hockey parents when we come back on Newstalk Radio.